It is my immense pleasure today to welcome Dr. Cheng Nian Yun, a performance scholar, educator, and dramaturg. Dr. Cheng completed her PhD in Theatre and Performance Studies at the University of Sydney in 2020. Her thesis, The Storytelling State, Performing Life Histories in Singapore, won the 2021 John Lick Prize for Best Thesis in Asian Studies. She's a researcher at the Intercultural Theatre Institute, as well as an honorary associate of the School of Literature, Art and Media at Sydney University. Her research centres around the intersections between storytelling, digital dramaturgy and interculturality in performance making processes. Her work has been published in Studies in Theatre and Performance, Performance Paradigm and the Oral History Review, among others. Today, Dr. Shing will be giving a talk titled, I was born in the year of nothing, the art of Charlie Chan Hock Chai as peri-performative life narrative. Dr. Shing, please. Thank you so much, uh, Cheryl. And uh, thank you so much to the English department um, for this opportunity to present in this wonderful series on uh, Singapore studies. And thank you all for dialing in today, this Friday morning in Singapore or from wherever you are. Um, so the art of Charlie Chang Hot Chai presented by Sunny Liu needs very, very little introduction for many of us here in the audience today. Um, but for those of us out of the loop, uh, this graphic novel, which is ambiguously and cheaply framed here as presented by Sunny Liu, uh, chronicles the life and times of a fictional comic book artist, Charlie Chan Hock Chai, who produced artworks and comics of various genres and styles that depicted events in Singapore's history. Um, and it's usually from the position or perspective that is more sympathetic to those of the victims and villains, uh, so-called, of these events than is officially characterized by mainstream narratives. But before I give too much away, uh, I want to start by addressing the title of my talk. Uh, I was born in the year of nothing. So where does the quote uh, of this title uh, come from? It comes from the first time we encountered Charlie. So Charlie is sitting on a chair being interviewed about his life, uh, uh, presumably by Sunny Liu, but we don't really know. And these first couple of pages of Charlie is a very key moment for me, which I will come back to and explore in more depth very shortly. But for now, I just want to point out one of the things that Charlie tells his interview is this, interviewer is this. So as for me, he says, I was born in the year of nothing. So it was a year of little significance as far as Singapore's history is concerned, he claims. So that may be the case for Charlie, but it is important to note that the art of Charlie Chan Hock Chai itself was not born in the year of nothing. It was first launched in May 2015. And for us Singaporeans, we all know that the year 2015 was a monumentally significant year in our history with Singaporeans mourning the death of our founding brother Lee Kuan Yew uh, in March and celebrating our golden jubilee in August that year. So it is in this context of national commemoration that the art of Charlie Chan Hock Chai was born and immediately became embroiled in controversy uh, thanks to the National Arts Council withdrawing their publishing grant uh, the day before launch due to its sensitive content. So despite or perhaps be or because of this controversy, uh, sales of this book actually soared and the novel's uh, first and second print run sold out within a month. Um, it's a classic case of the Streisand effect. So the novel's popularity and neg legacy, however, outgrew uh, its contentious beginnings and it has since become one of Singapore's most iconic pieces of literature, uh, winning the Singapore Literature Prize in 2016 and um, the uh, also Sunny Liu became the very first Singaporean to win the, the prestigious Eisner Award, which is like the, the Oscars for comic books, um, for best writer slash artist. That was in 2017. So the birth of the art of Charlie Chan Hock Chai must also be understood, I believe, within the context of what I call the storytelling state, which is a phenomenon which reached its first peak uh, in the same year, 2015, amid the F aforementioned atmosphere of national commemoration. So what is the storytelling state? It is a phenomenon whereby public autobiographical storytelling of ordinary people from all walks of life uh, proliferates the national mediascape in bite-sized uh, consumable uh, pieces. So life stories have become basically the new communicative paradigm between state and society and vice versa. And I've spoken and written quite extensively about this phenomenon in several other contexts, which I'm happy to provide links for uh, at the end of this talk. But 
Essentially, there are three important aspects to how the storytelling state manifests in Singapore. So first, the production and proliferation of life history telling entails either direct or indirect uh, state involvement in facilitating this phenomenon through governmental agencies, uh, government-linked uh, institutions, and non-governmental organizations. And it is very important to note that not all initiatives are top-down. Uh, the storytelling state is necessarily a shared project uh, between stakeholders in both state and society. And I mean, even that uh, distinction can be blurred. So uh, second, the auto autobiographical storytelling in such a state um, never comes in the form of a single sustained account of a life. When I say autobiographical, I'm always bracketing the auto uh, from the biographical. Uh, yeah, so they are never a single sustained account of a life, but are composed of uh, clusters of short accounts uh, surrounding a certain theme or a project or campaign. So as such, there is the impression of a multiplicity of perspectives. And third, uh, these stories tend to be elicited through the process of life history interviewing. Uh, uh, be uh, in the med mediated presentation of these interviews, uh, be it through video, photography, or text, the embodied and the emplaced and the affective effects uh, of the telling are brought to the fore. Um, professional media and branding companies are usually involved in this process. So here are some storytelling state projects that I have imagined in my, uh, sorry, examined in my research thus far, which encapsulate these three aspects. And, you know, in the Q&A, you are very much welcome to uh, share with me anything beyond 2020 that you know about uh, that falls under or is similar to uh, these projects. So I'm sure, you know, you've encountered at least uh, some of them if you have been living in Singapore for the past decade. And it is also important to note that although Singapore is the storytelling state par excellence, um, I know that this phenomenon is not unique to Singapore. Uh, for one, the beginnings of the storytelling state actually took inspiration from the United States, you know, from organizations like StoryCorps and uh, immensely popular projects like Humans of New York. So for another, I also know places like Asia, in Asia, like Hong Kong and Taiwan, all have very, very strong uh, ongoing memory projects as well. So Singapore is, is only one node, albeit a significant one, uh, in a global storytelling phenomenon facilitated by new and digital media. So in my research, I have identified both the impetus behind and implications of the storytelling state in the Singaporean context, in a way, uh, these life histories mark a shift by the state to include qualitative evidence as a communicative strategy. So prior to the storytelling state, um, tenets like meritocracy, multiracialism, and global capitalism have been very carefully maintained by policies which were implemented with what sociologist Chua Bing Huat famously uh, termed as instrumental rationality. Um, so under this instrumentality, only so-called concrete evidence of a statistical type uh, and no qualitative or soft evidence or in principle arguments are recognized um, by the pragmatic government. But now things are different. More voices are heard and more lives seem to matter. Uh, from the single mom with three jobs to the nurse who graduated from ITE to the migrant worker uh, from Bangladesh. So that being said, what are some latent effects that a storytelling state engenders? I, I can't go into too much detail here, but essentially there are, there are three things to take note of. So although there seems to be a huge number of stories, they tend to be, again, short, decontextualized accounts showcasing complete narrative arcs of redemption with happy endings, which I argue forecloses the discussion of social issues on a systemic level. So simply put, the happy endings create the impression that um, these issues have been resolved. Also, while these stories uh, are marketed as authentic windows to the private self, uh, whether is it the past self or present self, um, in reality, any uh, life history interview uh, anywhere is a framed, uh, curated, and potentially even coercive uh, performance event. So the role of the interviewer, uh, along with the role of professional branding or marketing agencies, in these stories is usually hidden to bolster the idea of these stories materializing from the ground up, you know, free from commercial forces. Uh, thirdly, the storytelling state interpolates certain kinds of subjectivities as more recognizable than others. So the act of interpolation also fixes these subjectivities into these recognizable categories, uh, depending on the requirements of the storytelling campaign. 
And these narratives then become performative repetitions that congeal into norms of uh, living, doing, and being Singaporean. And ultimately, the storytelling state is fundamentally about how to live a good life, um, a life that conventionally amounts to something, a life that makes the right positive uh, emotional attachments you know, to family, uh, to heteronormative romantic relationships, uh, to careers or to nation. So my argument uh, in this presentation is that the art of Charlie Chan Hock Chai, published at a time when the storytelling state was working at full steam for SG50, uh, functions as a critical response to the issues that I just outlined. On the surface, it shares some similarities to the phenomenon. Uh, it features uh, autobiographical so storytelling in the context of Singaporean history. But at every turn, uh, Charlie Chan, the novel, and Charlie Chan, um, the person or character, resists any effort to present a seamless continuity between story, storyteller, and nation. So Charlie does not give an account of himself. So this heading uh, is based on Judith Butler's 2005 uh, treatise, Giving an Account of Oneself, which, as I will evidently explain, Charlie does not do. Uh, so I am a performance scholar, so I watch out for performance in pretty much everything as an occupational hazard. So in the art of Charlie Chan Hock Chai, I would contend that it is moments where Sunny Liu portrays his oral history interviews uh, with Charlie through the medium of uh, comic illustration that the performative elements of um, his novel come most strongly to the fore. In uh, her analysis of Majan Satrapi's exemplary graphic autobiography, uh, Persepolis, uh, theatre scholar Jennifer Worth considers graphic novels that incorporate the personal nature of narrative, the presence of the body, and a focus on embodiment, and the concern with art and life as a process to be particularly suited to be read as an unconventional form of solo performance. So despite this fictionality, or even because of it, uh, the art of Charlie Chan of Chai contains these elements and more. So by presenting Charlie's life story primarily in the form of interview snippets and autobiographical comics, uh, the performative process of giving an account of oneself is highlighted and destabilized. The embodied aesthetic representation or representation of this dialogic encounter in graphic form can be used to critique the privileging of the interview as a self-referential and self-evident window to personal memories that constitute a unified I. Liu's involvement, both, both as interviewer and as the creator of Charlie, uh, further destabilizes this self-evident unity pre presented in interviews. So, by disrupting the conventions of the performative act of giving an account of oneself, Liu's novel can be said to be peri-performative in nature. So what is peri-performativity? Uh, performatives, uh, as famously conceptualized by a linguistic scholar, uh, J.L. Austin, are statements that, true to its name, perform a certain action in the world. So some very common formatives include, uh, you know, I promise, or I sentence you, or I hereby declare you man and wife. But of course, they, these must be uttered by the correct kind of people in the correct kind of ritual context. Um, so Judith Butler, borrowing from uh, Louise Althusser's uh, concept of ideological interpolation, also suggests that performatives can come in the form of hailing someone as a certain identity or certain subject, as in, it's a girl, or to my fellow countrymen. However, the peri-performative, uh, as the name suggests, um, the peri-performative is coined by Eve Sedgwick, by the way, um, is a kind of utterance that lies in the vicinity of performatives as a form of response, uh, be it as an oblique reference or an outright rejection. So in other words, peri-performatives consist of statements surrounding or talking about performatives. And she explains that unlike uh, performatives which depend on normative conventions and scripts, um, just like the wedding ritual, for example, uh, peri-performatives cannot fill in the blanks of any pre-existing performative convention. So sometimes peri-performatives can actually be more powerful than performatives themselves. And I'll give a very famous example in the Singaporean context, Lee Kuan Yew's moment of anguish. 
So in this immortalized uh, press conference, uh, Singapore's first prime minister is actually skirting around the events that led to the performative declaration of Singapore's independence, uh, repeating himself, uh, trying to find the right words and taking very long pauses that go beyond the limits of convention of official state discourse and um, eventually breaking down altogether famously. But it is this unconventional performance and not the proclamation of Singapore that was signed hours prior that is remembered by the um, average Singaporean as uh, this picture of uh, the NDP in SG50 suggests 50 years later. So Cedric suggests that the peri-performative does not necessarily represent a diminution in force from the explicit performative because as a spatial concept, its ambit can cover more than one performative and um, or, or illocutionary act. So as I suggest that, uh, I suggest that Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew's uh, peri-performative press conference is more forceful than the signing of Singapore's pro proclamation precisely because on that day at least, uh, Singapore came to be as a result of two performatives, not one, which is the announcement of uh, Singapore's ejection of Malaysia and the declaration of independence. So in other words, a birth by separation. Scholar Anna Poletti, in her examination of queer life documentaries, draws from Sedgwick's concept to suggest that peri-performative life narratives uh, destabilize the consensus values or ideologies, uh, which are the formal techniques for narrating a life that constructs a trustworthy subject, that give the performative utterance its power to do something in the world. So likewise, the oblique manner in which Liu presents Charlie's account of himself uh, critiques the terms and frameworks under which an I or a self is constituted, considered trustworthy and can speak. So one of the common frameworks in which the self is constituted is the life history interview. But the performative conventions and frames of the life history interview are disrupted from the very first time we encountered Charlie in the moment that I described earlier. So two panels taking up a page uh, show Charlie sitting on a chair uh, in this page on the left, relating a fact about the naming of Malaysia. And did you know that this SI in Malaysia uh, comes from Singapore? You know, from the merger in 1960s, so Malaya became uh, Malaysia. So three things can immediately be discerned on this first page. So for one, instead of the beginning, beginning as is conventional in oral history interviews with the performative utterance of his name and his date of birth, uh, thus commencing the life history uh, so process of self-constitution, Charlie's first declaration in the novel is a peri-performative one, the first of many he will make about the naming of a nation. Second, Charlie's reliability as narrator is already suspect, as the end notes for this page reveal that, the, uh, that this fact is actually anecdotal in nature. And third, this declaration is framed as a rhetorical question, did you know, uh, which even without the need for an answer already interpolates an audience uh, slash witness to an interviewer on this first page, um, uh, yeah, so to, to, Char sorry, to Charlie's storytelling. Although the second page would confirm the presence of an interviewer, which we presume to be Sunny Liu, um, on this first page, it is uh, cannily ambiguous who he is talking to, which is um, invoking the ambiguity uh, of, uh, of an inherent in oral history interviews with you know, a tape recording for a future ghostly audience, you know, who is he speaking for? And even, you know, who is speaking? And the next page teases out this second question about who is speaking. Uh, first with a panel where Charlie doesn't speak, instead facing us and or the interviewer with a cryptic, awkward expression, as if waiting for the tape recorder to be turned on for said ghostly audience. And when he does speak, he speaks again, not of himself, uh, but of a famous Japanese comic artist. In the beginning, there was Tezuka. They called him the god of manga. It was as if Tezuka was the beginning of Charlie's life. Uh, Charlie gets up from the chair to go and find um, one of Tezuka's works to show Liu, uh, his interviewer, who interjects before he goes too far and leaves the frame of the panel and the frame of the interview. And Charlie acquiesces, um, sitting back down and finally stating his name, uh, his year of birth, sorry. Yeah, again, as for me, I was born in the year of nothing, 1938. 
And even then, he defies the conventional answer demanded by the standard interview question. Uh, when were you born? So whether Liu did ask the question in this way, however, readers can only guess uh, because Liu's interjection, as well as all of the questions he would ask in this, as an interviewer in the novel, are uh, encased in speech balloons that point to a location outside of the panel frame, uh, rendered unintelligible as chicken scratch marks, not unlike uttered by um, uh, Snoopy's friend Woodstock in uh, Charlie Schultz's uh, classic strip Peanuts. So as with Peanuts, uh, readers of Liu's interview segments have to do the interpretive work of figuring out for themselves what the questions were. And in a way unique to the medium of comics, uh, this artistic choice goes against the conventional uh, grain followed by most interview-based stories produced within the storytelling state to render the presence of the interviewer invisible altogether. To do so in the context of the art of Charlie Chan Hao Chai would produce a seamless life story as if solely spontaneously narrated by Charlie, which would go against the novel's reflexive uh, treatment of storytelling. So the disruptive, strange presence of these uh, unreadable marks prompts readers to think about the interviewer's role more effectively than if Liu had openly stimulated the question in the first place. So another way Liu asks who is speaking is in his treatment of Charlie's moving body during these interview segments. Uh, as, an, as a comic artist, Liu is necessarily concerned with depicting three-dimensional movement onto the page, you know, an issue that he explicitly addresses uh, uh, in the novel as when Charlie, um, shortly after this uh, first moment that I just described, relates the memory of reading Tezuka uh, on page seven. And the comic really seemed to move, he said. So to illustrate the movement in his interview scenes, Liu eschews using flashy motion lines as Tezuka does, uh, instead presenting Charlie's body with slight, very slight changes across regularly shaped panels. Uh, taken as a whole, um, such a page seems static as Charlie does not appear to move much. The rigidity of the panel frame seems to trap Charlie within it, in an, an idea exacerbated by the regularity of the pages gutters, you know, which are the spaces between comic panels, um, in a layout which creates a grid of sorts, much like the pattern of a waffle iron. So literature scholar Philip Holden has suggested in his analysis of Charlie's strip, A Mountain Cannot Abide by Two, uh, cannot abide two Tigers, uh, which employs a very similar page layout, uh, that the grid illustrates the rigidity of historical narratives that the individual lives are forced to fit within. But I, I interpret this uh, grid, at least when used in other strips, differently. So the regularity of the panels highlights the unfolding of a life, but not in the discursive sense, um, but in the way that, as uh, Brian Masumi puts it, uh, the body is in passage or in process to the extent that it is dynamic and alive. And this is because the layout of such panels engenders a particular spatiality and temporality that resists any single fixed image uh, an effect unique to the medium of comics and graphic novels that render uh, multiple repetitions of the body on the page. And these are not, however, repetitions of the same. Uh, the incremental shifts in gesture or expression in each panel, uh, which a turn of the neck, you know, a sigh, a look of recollection, are qualitative differences, transitions facilitated by the embodied way we read comics, the movement of our eyes from one panel to the next. The body is indeed confined and limited by societal structures and narratives, but as Liu's temporally unfolding layout illustrates, it is also constantly emerging and becoming as we move, alluding to the potential to change our own account of ourselves, as Charlie or slash Liu does with a pencil. And like a moving target, Charlie never stays still long enough to be fixed by one recognizable subjectivity. And this destabilizes the force of per performative life narratives in the storytelling state which so often responds to the interpolating question, who are you, uh, with comprehensible self-evident answers, reaffirming what it means to be an intelligible subject in Singapore. Besides critiquing the performance frame of the oral history interview, the art of Charlie Chan of Chai fundamentally interrogates the consensus values and what it means to have a life in Singapore, to be recognized as having a life. Uh, Liu does this most overtly through the comparison between the life trajectories of uh, Charlie and Bertrand Wong, who is Charlie's former partner in producing comics. So according to Charlie's autobiographical comic, The Most Terrible Time of My Life, 
It was Bertrand who first recognized Charlie as a comic artist when they were teenagers in 1955, literally hailing him on, in the street in a pseudo Arthusian scene of a policeman's hail of, hey, you there. Um, Bertrand helps to launch their career together shortly after. And yet it was also Bertrand who, after eight years of struggling to make ends meet with Charlie, decides to end the partnership in order to start earning and saving money for marriage and a family. And the most terrible time of my life um, ends with a quietly distraught Charlie facing Bertrand on the street. Uh, Bertrand wants some sort of acknowledgement or understanding of his decision, he says Charlie. And Charlie again refuses to answer, instead echoing Bertrand's first hail to Charlie, the artist. Readers um, meet Bertrand again when Liu interviews him in 2010. And by then, despite uh, the subversive work that he and Charlie had done together in their youth, Bertrand had fully embraced the ideology of pragmatism and affective attachments demanded by the neoliberal developmental state. And he even rehearses a very common peri performative uh, Singaporeans make as justification for his pragmatic turn. Uh, he says, so when Singapore left Malaysia in uh, 1965, it was naturally a period of uh, real anxiety. Bertrand seamlessly aligns his life story with that of the Singapore story. 1965, he says, was also the year I had my first child. And walking with his grandson uh, in the park during the interview, he performs familiar and familial attachments to the appropriate happy objects of Singaporean life. And in contrast, Charlie's single-minded dedication to his work as a comic artist and his lack of success means has, uh, the lack of success is very important, uh, means that in the eyes of Singaporean society, he would always be marginalized, never becoming recognizable as a productive neoliberal citizen subject. A Bertrand's interview is shortly followed by scenes of Charlie's failure to live a good life in Singapore, uh, to make um, a living, get married, buy a house, raise a family, give back to society and the economy. And Charlie's commitment to his transgressive artistic integrity and his scathing critical stance against commercialization and commodifica commodification means that he has never been able to make a good living. Instead, he lives in a government subsidized rental flat and he never had the wife or children his mother so often reminded him to save for. Uh, you know, she says she always reminds him there's nothing more important than being able to put, put food in the table for the ones you love. His only potential love interest marries uh, a successful businessman. And as an only son, Charlie is also a failure. He refused to take over his parents' store and could not afford to pay for his father to have life-saving surgery overseas. And yet he never gives up his passion for drawing, uh, avoiding the potentially cruelly optimistic fantasies, as the late Lauren uh, Ballant would put it, of the good life and upward mobility in the age of advanced capitalism. But that is not to say, sorry, that is not to say that Charlie never experienced bouts of cruel optimism of his own, with occasional expressions of his fantastical attachment um, to being an acclaimed comic artist, especially when it uh, became clear that he would not be recognized for his aesthetic achievements in Singapore or abroad. However, these fantasies come with the understanding that, as he tells Liu, there can be no compromise in the artist's work if the goal is true freedom of expression. And this explains why Charlie deliberately avoids participating in Singapore's public sphere altogether, preferring to remain a marginal figure. In the years after independence, Charlie's critical and subversive works remain mostly unpublished or self-published. In this way, he can be said to perform what Wendy Brown has called freedom's silences, when refusing to participate in an intimate public sphere becomes a response from below. Charlie's lack of recognition as an artist becomes his shelter from state power. And therefore, when he boldly calls himself Singapore's greatest comics artist in his interview with Liu, it is less a grandiose uh, delusion than an act of disinterpolation from normative expectations of what it means to be an ideal citizen subject in Singapore. Uh, so without contextual knowledge of Charlie's fictionality, the novel ambiguously stated on the cover as presented by Sunny Liu is rather believable as a biography showcasing the life and work of Charlie Chan Hock Chai, a pioneering but largely forgotten comics artist in Singapore. Uh, this was how the um, uh, epigram books playfully advertised the novel in their website. So in this performance, Liu is a mere cataloger and oral history interviewer, compiling and archiving the impressive work of Charlie, who features 
which features key events and personalities in Singapore's history. Um, yeah, in reality, of course, as Liu himself was responsible for everything within this scrapbook, you know, from six-year-old Chan's six-year-old Chan's misshapen uh, Donald Duck drawn in 1944 to the work in progress Dato Duck strip drawn almost 70 years later. To call Liu's novel fictional, uh, however, would be a flat assessment that fails to take into account the layers upon layers of storytelling that Liu has woven. And the art of Charlie Chanong Chai has been described by scholars as historiographic metafiction, a reflexive work that draws attention to its constructed nature. And this effect is created, for example, by the unironic presence of Liu's commentary and analysis of Charlie's work in Singapore's historical context, maintaining the illusion of Charlie's existence, even as the novel as a whole demonstrates a reflexivity on the authorial and authoritative process of storytelling. So in one of his interviews, Charlie muses over one of his early works, Ahuat's Giant Robot Volume 2, where a boy uses a remote controlled robot to fight against the British riot police in the 1955 Hockley bus strike. And he reads aloud a scene where the boy's cute dog, Yo-Yo, gets flung to the ground by British water cannons and then admits un unapologetically to his interviewer, is it manipulative? Sure. Uh, but that's how you tell stories. And Liu, seeming to gain personally, personal insights from Charlie in such interviews, is also upfront about the ways in which Charlie manipulates his audience. All this time, however, readers also have to reckon with the fact that the character of Charlie Chan, all of his comics, and even or especially Liu's paratextual insertions, are equally manipulated, skillfully shaped by Liu himself. So when I first read the Out of Charlie Chan Chai, for, uh, I, as much as I was pulled into um, the virtuosic visual narration of Charlie's story, I experienced moments of what felt, felt close to dissonance, uh, jarring reminders of the fictive processes behind this work are triggered by the juxtaposition between the plain violation of the indexical relationship of the narrator, which is the Liu in the novel, and the author, who is the Liu created, uh, who created the novel and also the novel's highly reflexive critique of such manipulations. So indeed, I argue that Liu's work transgresses the boundaries of the Singapore story because of the multi-dimensional way in which authorship and the construction of historical knowledge is critiqued, and not necessarily because of the subversive content of Charlie's comics. And in fact, Charlie's comics themselves are not really nuanced social commentaries. As accomplished as they are as pieces of art, they sometimes hit their point across, at least in terms of content, rather on the nose. Uh, the subtlety and nuance of Liu's critique therefore li lies less in the content of these comics and how they are presented, which makes visible Charlie's narrative frames and how they can be transgressed or broken. Uh, so Liu's liberal usage of metalepsis, which is the transgressive movement between story levels and non-fictional worlds across time and space, draws attention to the performative framing, making and remaking uh, of story and history telling. And as readers, we have to fill in the gaps, judging for ourselves where the blurred lines between narrative and history, author and narrator, memories and the past should be drawn and if they can be drawn at all. In this sense, uh, Liu's work embodies what Tracy Davis calls performative time in which the systemic presence is not just backward looking toward the past and speculative about the future, but engages with all three temporalities experientially. With Liu's manipulation of time and uh, space, pasts and pres uh, presents and futures, uh, it seems like Charlie to be dreaming of a country that is yet to be. Uh, Singapore, just like his story, is not a finished product, uh, but in inevitably in a process of becoming. And readers are faced with the fact that one can and should critically examine the circumstances surrounding the construction of histories and apprehend the possibility of reconstruction in the future. Liu ends his novel with an allegory uh, that makes this suggestion clearer than ever. So in the novel's epilogue, Charlie in present day, an old man who is still drawing despite having never gained the artistic recognition he deserved, um, takes Liu backstage talking about the process and making comics, uh, using whiteout, uh, pasting new drawings over existing ones, you know, setting the drawing surface at a certain angle. And nine panels distributed evenly three by three across a full page are dedicated to depicting Charlie's bony fingers, uh, painstakingly taking an inked brush, uh, 
on the sketch of Ahwat holding the remote control of his robot, revealing the iconic picture as seen on the cover of Charlie, uh, the art of Charlie Chan Hao Chai on the novel's final page. And there is a sense of closure and completion, the beginning and the end, sealed by uh, the finishing touch of Charlie's name stamped in traditional Chinese red ink on the bottom right. And But Liu tellingly does not erase the traces of blue rough sketch beneath the picture. The process must be seen with the product and even completed the work is not finished. The story does not end here. And Charlie's own life story without an end will always be around as an alternative reply and indeed a peri-performative response to the questions that produce normative utterances in the storytelling state. That's all. Thank you.